In this video, we will begin to review for the final exam. So our goals for this section are to do practice problems to help prep for the final. Okay, so all right, so I'm going to begin the actual review. So this isn't just an overview video. I'm going to begin the actual review. And this video is going to focus on increasing and decreasing functions and concavity. All right, so I want to look at one of the final practice problems from part two. Part two was from the second half of the class. And I want to look at problem eight, part C. So we're looking at eight, part C here. So we have this function h of x. And we need to figure out, well, where is this function increasing and decreasing? Determine whether each critical number is a local max, a local min, or neither. And then determine the intervals where this function is concave up and down. And then use that to figure out the x values of any inflection points. So basically, it wants us to do everything that we can involving increasing, decreasing, and a concavity. OK, so I want to begin with a warm-up question. So the question is, for this function, can we take the derivative without the quotient rule? Pause the video for one minute to try this question. It's a yes or no question, but if you do think yes, uh, I want you to explain why. If you do think no, also explain why. So four, three, two, one, pause the video. Pause the video just for a minute and see if you can answer this question. All right, so hopefully you've done that. Hopefully you've paused the video for about a minute to try this and think about this. So the answer is yes, we actually can do this without the quotient rule. So what does that look like? So for my function h of x, even though this is a fraction, I can split this fraction up as x cubed over x squared and then minus 4 over x squared. So I can split it up into two fractions and then simplify them. So the first fraction becomes x. The next one, if I want to take the derivative of it, I could write it as minus 4 x to the negative 2. So bring up that x squared term. And from here, now this is easy to take the derivative of. So the derivative of x is 1, but the next term, the negative 2, comes down, and I'll get plus 8x to the negative 3. OK, and if I wanted to simplify this and get rid of that negative exponent, I would get 1 plus 8 over x cubed. OK, but I, so notice I can take the derivative without quotient rule. And why this is useful is, it helps me save some time. So if I wanted to do this derivative with the quotient rule, I definitely could. This is just a little bit quicker. And when it comes to something like a time test, it's helpful to know multiple ways to do something so we can decide, well, which one's the most efficient one. All right, so let's first think about, well, where is this thing increasing and decreasing? And then we'll move on from there to the critical points and finding local mins and maxes and then concavity after that. Okay, so first I want to give you the chance to try this problem. So pause the video for about four minutes to try this question. That's almost definitely not going to be enough time to finish it, but hopefully you'll have a chance to make progress on increasing and decreasing and maybe finding local mins, local maxes. Okay, so pause the video for three, two, one, pause that video. Pause the video and try this for about four minutes. For these review videos, the time that you use to pause and actually try the problem is the most valuable time during the video because you're practicing the skill that I'm going to be assessing during the test, which is you're practicing your ability to apply concepts that you've learned to tackle new problems. All right, so hopefully you've done that. Hopefully you paused it and tried it for about four minutes. All right, so let's talk about it together. So for increasing, decreasing, we are going to first need to find where the derivative equals zero or the derivative is undefined or the derivative is undefined. All right, so the derivative is undefined somewhere. It happens to be undefined when x is 0, because that's what makes the denominator 0. OK, so now let's figure out when the derivative is equal to 0. So I have 1 plus 8 over x cubed. Let's set that equal to 0. And 
let's move one of these terms to the other side. So I'll get one equals negative eight over x cubed. So from here, I can multiply both sides by the denominator. I can multiply by x cubed, and I'll get x cubed on the left. On the right, I'll get negative eight. Okay, now I can cube root both sides. So x is gonna be equal to the cube root of a negative eight. And the cube root of negative eight is negative two. All right, so we take our values that make the derivative zero and that make the derivative undefined, and now we make a sign chart. So now we make a sign chart using the above values. And maybe I should say a sign chart of uh, the first derivative of h prime. Okay, so let's make a number line and start to make the sign chart. Okay, so I'll have my number line. Okay, so one of my values was negative two, and one of my values was zero. So I'll keep track of my derivatives and then the original function. Okay, so I'm making a sign chart, so splitting it up into sections now. Okay, so just so I remember, my derivative was one plus eight over x cubed. All right, so now let's pick some test points in my regions. So maybe to the left of negative two, whoops. So maybe to the left of negative two. Sorry, I'm just moving that up to give myself some more room. So the left of negative two, maybe I'll pick negative three. In between negative two and zero, I can pick negative one. And then bigger than zero, maybe I'll just pick positive one there. And I have to plug these into my derivative. So let's first do h prime of negative three. Plugging that in, we'll get one plus eight over negative three cubed. And if we work out what this is, this ends up being a positive number. So the derivative is positive over here. Okay, so the other two test points, I'm gonna skip the work of plugging them in, although you should show it. So just to save some time, I'm gonna skip the work. So if I plug in negative one, and then if I plug in positive one, if I plug in positive one, it turns out I'll get a positive number. If I plug in negative one, I will get a negative number. So this is negative, and this is positive. Okay, so when my derivative is positive, that means my function, the original function is increasing. So it's increasing, which means it's going up, it's going up. And then where the derivative is negative, the original function is decreasing, so it's going down. All right, so let's write down our critical numbers after this. So the critical numbers, critical numbers. Oops, critical numbers. Okay, so we have x equals negative two, that's a critical number. But zero is actually not a critical number. So why is that? X equals zero, let's first just write it down. X equals zero is not, not a critical number since, there's two things that we need for something to be a critical number. It's either gotta make the derivative equal to zero or make the derivative undefined. And zero did that, zero made the derivative undefined, which is good. But the other thing that I need is, for something to be a critical number, it needs to be in the domain of the original function. But if I try to plug zero into my original function here, it's gonna make it undefined. So there's no point on my graph where x is zero. So it can't be a critical number. Okay, so that's an important point right there. This is a common, uh, common error that people make. Okay, so this is not a critical number since it's not, it's not in the domain of the original function h. So why that matters for us is now when we go to classify our critical numbers to see if they're local mins or local maxes, zero can't be anything. It's not gonna be a local min or a local max because it's not, my original function isn't even defined at zero. 
Okay, so in a minute, I'll show you the graph of this function just to show, wait, why is there not a local min at zero? Because it kind of seems like there should be. All right, so there's a key thing that I want to also note about this. And that is any x value that makes the derivative equal zero or that makes the derivative undefined goes on our increasing decreasing number line of the first derivative. Even, so this is what I'm gonna to add to this, even values that are not in the domain of f. So here I'm being more general. This is a general comment, not just about my example. So that's why I'm calling the function f and not h like it was in my example. Okay, so again, key takeaway from this note is anything that makes the derivative zero or that makes the derivative undefined goes on the number line. I do not need to worry about whether they're in the domain of f for the number line. I do need to worry about if they're in the domain of the original function when I say what my critical numbers are. All right. Okay, so now let's say where are my function, where is it increasing, where is it decreasing? So it's increasing on negative infinity to negative two, union zero to infinity, and it's decreasing on the interval from negative two to zero. So this we get from the number line. So here was our number line again. It's increasing on the two outer intervals, decreasing on the middle interval. All right, so let's box this. Okay, so we have our increasing decreasing intervals. Now the problem said, well, to classify the critical numbers. So we know that we only had one critical number actually. It was just x equals negative two. And x equals two is going to be a, let's look back to our number line. So x equals negative two, it's a critical number. And my function changes from increasing to decreasing. So if it changes from increasing to decreasing, and I know it's a critical number, the first derivative test says, oh, that's a local max. That is a local max. Okay, so going back up to my work, x equals negative two is a local max, and I should justify why. It's since h prime changes from positive to negative. So by the first derivative test, h changes from, the original function is gonna change from increasing to decreasing. Whoops, sorry, not two, at, at x equals two. Okay, so that is my reasoning there. So you might be wondering, wait, by that logic, at zero, the function changes from decreasing to increasing. So why isn't there a local min? So there's something that happens when there are values like zero um, that make the original function undefined so that even if the function changes, like from decreasing to increasing, there isn't a local min there. So let's look at the graph. Okay, so here we are in Desmos, and I've got my original function entered in. Let's look at its graph. So with its graph, what's going on at x equals zero? There's a vertical asymptote here. So when there's a vertical asymptote, well, I'm definitely not gonna have a local max or a local min, because there's no point there. There's gotta be a point for it to possibly be a local max or a local min. But my function still changes, it's, it's decreasing on the left-hand side of zero, at least up until uh, it seems like when x is negative two. So it's decreasing on the left side of zero, but it's increasing on the right side of zero. So even though it changes from decreasing to increasing, there's no local min. And that's why that part about, oh, is it actually a critical number? Is x equals zero something in the domain of the original function is important. All right. So next, I want to do a brief review on concavity. So for the concavity review, I'm not going to talk about this example. So I am kind of stopping this example here, and I'll leave you to work out, well, where is the function concave up and concave down? But hopefully our di my discussion on concavity will help with that. Okay, so how do we figure out where a function is concave up and down? 
Okay, so there's a few steps. So to save time, I'm going to write these kind of quickly. So first, we find where the second derivative equals zero or or the second derivative is undefined. Next, we make a sign chart of the second derivative. So it's really similar to what we did with the first derivative and increasing and decreasing, just now we're doing it with the second derivative. Okay, so all numbers, all values that make the second derivative e be zero or the second derivative be undefined go on the number line even if they make the original function undefined. So just like with the first derivative and increasing decreasing, anything that makes my function, whether it's the first derivative for increasing decreasing or the second derivative for concavity, anything that makes it zero or undefined goes on that number line, even if it makes the original function undefined. All right, so let's look at a hypothetical scenario to test oh, how well do we understand this. Okay, so here's the hypothetical scenario. So let's say that we have the following number line for the second derivative. And let's suppose that f is continuous at x equals negative 1. And let's also suppose that with 3, even though 3 ended up being on my number line, that when we plug it back into the original function, my original function is not continuous at x equals 3. Okay, and then let's just say with the sign chart, the sign chart was positive here, positive here, and then negative in the middle. So when my second derivative is positive, the original function is concave up, or, or I'll write cu for concave up. So that means it has this sort of upwards u shape. So same thing on the right hand side, rightmost interval, it's concave up. And in the middle interval, where the second derivative is negative, the original function is concave down, or I'll write CD, so downwards U-shape. Okay, so let's recall our definition of inflection point. So my function has an inflection point at x equals C if, and there's two things that we need. So the first thing, so one of the things that we need is the concavity changes, either from concave up to concave down, or concave down to concave up. And there's one other thing. The other thing, and this is the part that people tend to forget the most when checking for inflection points, is that f needs to be continuous at x equals c. All right. So with that in mind, what are the inflection points here? Well, at negative 1, it was continuous, my original function was continuous, and the concavity changed. So x equals negative 1 is an inflection point. But what about at x equals 3? At x equals 3, even though the concavity changed, our original function wasn't continuous there, so it's not an inflection point. So x equals 3 is, x equals 3 is not an inflection point. So what might this look like in terms of the graph? So if I had some axes, and then I had three, I'm going to use the idea from uh, the previous graph that we looked at in Desmos. What if I had a vertical asymptote? So if I had a vertical asymptote, I could have a concave down situation on the left-hand side of it. So concave down, maybe something like this. Uh, and then concave up situation on the other side. So maybe that just looks like this. So concave up. So at 3 in this graph, the concavity switches down to up, but it's not an inflection point because the function wasn't continuous there. On an even more literal level, at x equals 3, at this number, there's no point. There's no point on the graph where 3 is. So if there's no point there, how can there be an inflection point? That kind of implies that there would need to be a point there in the first place, but there isn't. All right, so that is it for this video on increasing, decreasing concavity. In the next video, we're going to do some review of optimization.